Hey YouTube, welcome back to the channel, and today we're going to be going over some Ruby stuff. So this was a request from a friend of mine on exactly how to use blocks, procs, and lambdas. If you've done any Ruby development, then you'll run into these right away because Ruby likes to use blocks almost everywhere. And so I'm going to cover a little bit about that, and so you can understand when each of them is used and then a few tips and tricks from my experience where you can do some cool configuration stuff. All right, so to get started, we just have a simple uh, Ruby app, which is just a single file. So we have uh, app.rb. If I go over to our uh, split window here, so I have the file open on the left and we're gonna run the code on the right using Ruby app.rb. And I don't have anything else in here. It's just app.rb. By default, you're gonna have Ruby installed on a Linux or a Mac system typically, <laughs> like Arch Linux users, sorry. But if you do have it installed, then let's see what version I'm running. I can type better. Uh, so I'm running 302. I should probably update pretty soon, but that is what I'm running. If you haven't checked out my Tmux video, then this is exactly what I'm using and I'm trying out to do a little bit more Tmux and Vim stuff, which I've been really enjoying. So check those out in the comments and on your way, hit that subscribe button because there's a lot of people that still haven't subscribed. Like, what are you doing right now? Come on, let's clear this and let's go back over to our Ruby code and blocks, procs, and lambdas. All of these are what are called closures. And what closures are is a snippet of code that you can take and execute in a different context. You can define it almost like a function in some scenarios and then take that and execute it at a later time in a few different ways, passing it around to different other functions. So this is how you do things like currying, like you pass these functions and you kind of build and do this functional style of programming. So closures facilitate that and they're just these little snippets of code that do stuff. We'll talk a little bit more later in the video on some gotchas with that, but stay tuned and we'll go over the blocks first so blocks in this first example here if you've done any kind of ruby programming then this is how you define a function and you have you know a simple method uh, you use def to define it and then you have in this case we're going to just do a simple iterator so a while loop and the thing that is probably new or you haven't seen very much is this yield statement and so what this does is allows a block to be yielded to and so you can see like we don't we don't have anything explicitly calling out the block uh, in this example, but we are yielding to it. And so things like dot each or dot map, this is how some of those work. You can also add in your method, like if you were expecting a block, you can add like a return return statement if you're not getting one or something. Uh, but for this example, we're just yielding. Down here, we're actually making the call. So if we do this statement here, then you can see items is one, two, three, four or one, two, three, I should say, and we're calling it using this block. So this after the do statement is your block. Let me highlight that a little bit better. Okay, here we go, there we go. We have our method call here in the first bit, and then we have do, and we give it a variable, which, you know, in the little vertical dividers. Then in here, we're just doing a puts of each of those items, and items is defined here on line 15. We'll call this method, it'll loop over items, and it's gonna yield here in the definition of it. So if we come over to our code runner here, then we see item zero, one, and two, which is different from what we were seeing. So what exactly is happening? In here, we're actually getting the I value and outputting that instead of the item in the list. So we could change this. So we could do items of I, and if we do that, then we'll do items here, items, and put I inside of there. And now we should see one, two, three. So if we move over to save it, move over to our editor, or I should say our code runner, and we see one, two, three. And just to make sure that we're not crazy here, I'll even add uh, four and five. Save that, jump back over. There we go. So you can see we're running through that block 
and it's calling each of the items, it's yielding to it. If we wanted to pass this block to any function, then we could do that a different way. So let's jump down and we will comment this out. There we go. And we'll uncomment this other way. Whenever you are defining blocks, you have two options. Either you can do it between the do and end way, which is kind of synonymous with defining a function, or you can put it all in one line with these curly braces. Now, it's generally accepted to, like if it's a one-liner, you'll put it in a single line like this, but if it's multiple lines, then you wanna split it out into the do and end blocks. We can see it's doing the same thing here, so just to make sure that we're not crazy, we're gonna run it again, and we see exactly the same output, so we'll comment this out, and now we'll talk about implicit and explicit blocks. So before we were doing an implicit block where up here on line 10, <laughs> these relative numbers are throwing me off. Up here, when we're yielding, we're doing an implicit block. Whereas if we jump down to this explicit method here, then we actually expect to have a block passed in and we have that with an ampersand in the front of it. So if we don't call this function, with a block, it's gonna yell at us. And instead of yielding, we're actually doing a dot call on our block. And you see we're passing an I, which we've modified before to be items I, but let's run this. And if we run this method, then we see it gives us zero, one, two, three, four, because it's looping through the elements and not giving them, it's giving the index of them. So let's go back over and change this to an items items of i that way we're getting the actual item and not just the index of it and i'll run this again and you can see there is an exclamation mark at the end here so that we know we're executing the explicit method and not anything other than that so we're looping over it one two three four five we got the exclamation mark and we have an explicit block that's being called now you'll notice this api where you're doing a dot call is synonymous with any of these closures. So you can do a dot call on a lambda, you can do a dot call on a block, and if you, let's say, had a method and you wanted to do what's called duct typing, you can have a method called call. So, you know, you would have uh, some class call and then this class can behave like a lambda or any kind of closure. So keep that in mind. Uh, that's kind of a cool trick for defining APIs and doing duct typing whenever you want to interchange lambdas and actual classes. Uh, it's kind of a cool trick. All right, moving on. So we have talked about implicit versus explicit blocks. Now let's talk about procs. And so these are defined a little differently and a proc behaves exactly the same way as a block does, but it can be stored in a variable. So we have this method that takes a proc and using the same API, we do call, but whenever we're down here, we wanna store it into a variable. We haven't done that here. We've just passed it whenever we're invoking the method. And so if we come back over here and we have some method and we're passing in our proc, which says procify and gives us our in value, which for us is gonna be success because I just hard coded it there. We do that and we run our Ruby app. Then we can see it outputs success whenever we're passing in the proc value. So if you wanted to pass around these closures, a proc is a way to enable that. That way you don't have to pass you know that in right away when you're invoking the method. Instead, you pass it around like a variable. Let's go on to using explicit procs. So let's comment out this other method and I don't remember if I said this before, but all this code will be up on GitHub. The link is in the description. On your way there, hit the subscribe button or the like button if you've enjoyed it. And let's keep going with procs. So just like a proc, you can pass it in explicitly where you have the ampersand at the very beginning of your, your method there. This way you can do a proc.call and you can pass it in with the method invocation. So you don't have to pass it in as a variable you can pass it in as just your normal like block syntax where you tack it on. Uh, most APIs will do something like this. I, I should also note that 
you have to have your block at the end. So like if you up here, whenever we have two things that are being passed in, well, you have to have your block at the end for it to work. So if you're gonna do an explicit block, make sure it's the last variable in your list there. All right, so let's move down back to our explicit proc down here and let's run our Ruby stuff. And we can see proc with explicit, that's also a success. It's doing a very similar invocation, except with you know not passing in as a variable, but instead passing in as a normal block. All right, let's keep going on to lambdas. So lambdas, which is our third bucket here, these are procs, so that means that you can save them as a variable and pass them into other functions or, you know, other lambdas if you wanted to get crazy with it. So these have some special characteristics, though, where they behave like a function. They're going to give you argument errors. They're going to do returning a certain way, and we'll get into that right now. So if we have a variable here... And the way you uh, create a lambda is you just have lambda and then you have the curly braces and the normal item inside of the block and whatever, you know, needs to happen. This one's not very exciting. It just forwards everything on. If we do this and we run, then right now we have a wrong number of arguments because we aren't passing anything in. If we wanted to make this work, we could pass something in like one and save that. And if that, oh right, we aren't putting anything out. Let's fix that. We'll go over here and we'll just do a puts a, this should get us back to seeing something. And so we can see that there where it's outputting one, but the, the cool thing again is you get these argument errors if you don't give it the right information. So if you want something to blow up whenever you're passing around lambdas, then a lambda is what you want and not a proc. All right, so let's move on to the next example where we're talking about return statements. A proc is not going to allow you to do anything after it returns. Like if this return statement happens, then that's it end of function, like if you're, you know, yielding or doing a, a proc.call or a block.call and you want to do something afterwards, well, guess what? A proc is not going to let you perform any of that. Let's save this and I'll show you that behavior. So we can see pi gets output, which is here on line 58. And then we just return the number 10, but we never see this output reached, whereas if we commented out this line and moved over, then we see that it's reached, never reached, and we can see, you know, the proc kind of eats that, that information up for us. Know that if you return out of a proc, it's going to end the function right there, which a lot of times is not what you want. Maybe use a lambda in that case. So I'll show you if we wanted to retain normal return flow then we could use a Lambda. And for us, the Lambda returned 10, even though it returned 10 within the closure that it was using. So keep in mind if you, like a lot of times you're gonna use Lambdas, to be honest, like procs are kind of a special circumstance. If you return out of them, they're totally gonna ruin you know, your, your program there. So use them with caution. You're usually gonna use Lambdas. One of the really cool ways to use lambdas is called the stabby lambda. Let's comment out this stuff here. We are assigning a lambda to a variable, but you can see we're using a different syntax. So this stabby lambda, instead of the word lambda, lets you make it look a lot more like a function where you have, you know, the inputs on the left and not embedded inside of them. And then your your function definition, if you will. And so this lets you do some nice stuff. And then again, if you want to call it, if we wanted to pass a lambda to the each function, you know, similar to how we would pass a block, we could do it this way and let's save it. Save it better. There we go. Oh, I think I have caps lock on. That's why. 
All right, let's run our Ruby and we can see we get two, four and six because we're doubling each of the items and we're outputting it. Another cool thing with Stabby Lambdas is you could have them in a map and then you access that map. So think of, it's almost like dependency injection here where you're configuring and you're then grabbing something based on a key inside of Ruby. So you have your config with a map and then each of these can be a definition of, you know, some, some Lambda functionality. So if I wanted to have two different configs, say like, all right, I want config one to do this thing and config two to do this thing. Well, this is a way to facilitate that. So where you would, you know, call with config one and it would double it call with config two and it would quadruple it. And then you can see both of those are outputted there. So a nice thing to give you flexibility with stabby lambdas and putting them inside of a hash map. The only thing I will end with here is be careful whenever you're using closures. If for instance, inside of your Lambda, you have like an active record or a database call, then it's going to know that context and so it's gonna you know anytime you're passing around that context you could end up with like n plus one queries or other performance issues so be mindful of what you're using inside of your lambda whenever you're passing it around that's everything i have for today if you enjoyed the video please like and subscribe and i'll see you in the next one thanks